Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this lecture, we're going to go through the depression and anxiety medications for the advanced pharmacology course for nurse practitioners. So we're going to be talking specifically about depression and anxiety. So let's start at the very beginning. First of all, depression and anxiety. For the American Academy of Family Physicians, depression and anxiety does fall under primary care. So whether you're in school for FMP, for psych mental health, this is definitely something that's going to fall into either one of those, possibly a little bit beyond that, depending on what your specialty is. So when we're talking about depression and anxiety, we're going to start with doing a patient assessment. This can be a PHQ-9, which is one of the most commonly used assessment tools to assess for a patient's depression level, or a GAD-7, which is the, one of the most commonly used tools to assess for anxiety. We're going to assess the risk of suicide. And remember what you learned in nursing school. We're going to be very direct. We're not going to beat around the bush. Do you, have you thought about committing suicide? Have you thought you would be better off dead? Do you have a plan to kill yourself, et cetera? We're going to check uh, uh, history for substance abuse. We're obviously going to probe whatever the factors are that are causing them to have depression and or anxiety. Remember that depression is really a very fundamentally, it's an imbalance between a patient's stressors and a patient's coping mechanisms. All of us in life have a certain amount of stress and a certain amount of coping mechanisms. If at any point we have a ton of stress and not a lot of coping mechanisms, we end up with depression. Now, the solution there is obviously reduce the stress, which may not always be possible, or to increase the coping mechanism, which could be non-pharmacological interventions, which we'll discuss, or pharmacological interventions. When you're assessing a patient for depression or anxiety, make sure you order a full set of annual labs. We're going to check an STD panel if that's appropriate. We're going to check a toxicology report if that's appropriate. We're also going to be really, really important to make sure that we're checking for bipolar or other mental health issues, ADHD, uh, issues such as ADHD or schizophrenia. Because first of all, if you're working in FNP or primary care, that may be outside your scope of practice to deal with bipolar schizophrenia. Second of all, we know that a lot of patients that are being treated for depression are not being adequately treated because it's really underlying bipolar or something like that. Next, any patient who has depression and anxiety, we're always going to deal with non-pharmacological interventions. These need to be on an individual basis. So psychotherapy is for sure going to be number one. That's recommended to all patients that have any mental health issues. That's going to go see a marriage counselor if it's that, go see a um, a therapist in general or whatever specialty there is. Nowadays, there's therapists that specialize in everything from eating disorders to marriage counseling to pediatrics, et cetera. We can also recommend support groups if a patient has postpartum depression or is dealing with uh, drug addiction, things like that. We do have specific groups that we can recommend. Uh, exercise is always, I'm sure you guys already know this, every study has shown that exercise helps with depression um, and almost to the level or beyond the level of medication. So we're always going to recommend that meditation, as well as any other non-pharma invention the patient finds appropriate, such as reading, yoga, taking vacations, things like that. When you're treating a patient for depression and anxiety, make sure we set realistic expectations. We can't tell the patient, here's your Prozac, tomorrow life is going to be sunshine and rainbows. We have to make sure they understand that this isn't going to um, instantly make all your problems go, to, go away. But over the next two to four weeks, as the medication takes effect, you're going to start to notice that you're able to handle your depression or your anxiety better. When we're starting a patient on treatment for depression, anxiety, make sure we schedule a follow-up. It should be no more than 30 days after the initial visit, sooner if appropriate. Um, review their medical history specifically to do with any uh, history of, of mental health, because a lot of patients, especially if you're dealing with a um, adult population, a lot of them have been on different antidepressant, anti-anxiety medications in their past, maybe in their childhood or adolescent years. So you definitely wanna know about that to take that into consideration when you're prescribing that medication. And finally, but certainly most important of all is assess their risk of suicide. So we're gonna start talking about the actual drugs here. We're starting with the number one universally recommended first class for both depression and anxiety. A lot of times depression and anxiety go hand in hand. They have overlapping symptoms. They may have overlapping diagnoses. Fortunately, in pharmacology, that's the one thing that's easy in all of pharm is that these two uh, diseases, diagnoses are both treated or at least initially treated with the same class of drugs, and that is the SSRIs. You're probably familiar with most of these drugs, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro, um, Selexa, or Prozac, more uh, appropriately known as sertraline, paroxetine, escitalopram, citalopram, and fluoxetine. These drugs work, we'll start with the mechanism of action, by blocking the body from getting rid of serotonin. We know that every single thing in our body, from red blood cells to serotonin, the body is constantly producing and constantly getting rid of. In this case, we're going to stop the reuptake, stop the getting rid of, stop the body from destroying serotonin. But since the body's still producing serotonin, but it's no longer destroying at the same rate, 
we have an increased level of serotonin, which is what we are looking for. That's the mechanism of action. These are the first line drugs for depression and anxiety. Remember, especially for uh, APRN school, there's a lot of different anxiety diagnoses that this could be used for, such as general anxiety, generalized anxiety disorders, social phobias, PTSD, and so much more. Um, we do have an off-label use, which is premature ejaculation. You're going to learn in a second that one of the side effects of this drug is that it takes longer to have an orgasm, which in men is a treatment for premature ejaculation. In women, that's usually a negative side effect that it takes them longer or impossible for them to achieve an orgasm versus in men, that could be seen as a positive and that would be the treatment for premature ejaculation. So that's another off-label indication. If you are using it for that, we use specifically paroxetine. All of them can be used for it, but the guidelines do recommend paroxetine to be used for premature ejaculation. The side effects of this drug, insomnia, so therefore we wanna tell the patient take it in the morning. However, I have plenty of patients that take it in the evening and they say they have no issues with it. That's perfectly fine, but we're still gonna recommend it, certainly for test purposes to take it in the morning. The sexual dysfunction we already mentioned, GI effects, that goes with pretty much every single drug, as well as fatigue and dizziness. Um, next, consider other serotonin medications for risk of serotonin syndrome. This applies to all prescriptions for antidepressants. And we're gonna talk more about serotonin syndrome at the end. Just to go a little bit deeper here than you went in RN school, fluoxetine is gonna be the most recommended um, for pediatric patients. Escitalopram, that's Lexapro, is gonna be the most preferred for the geriatric patients. And sertraline, uh, which is Zoloft, is gonna be the most preferred in pregnancy. If you're getting just in the middle, your average everyday, otherwise healthy adult, not pregnant, not elderly, not pediatric, you really have a choice of which ones to use. However, um, Lexapro and, and uh, sertraline are by far the two most commonly used. Next, we have SNRI. So these are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. The two classic drugs used here are Venlafax and Anduloxetine. These would not be the first line drugs. Everything we're going to discuss from this point further would be a second line or even further down the line option to treat a patient's depression and anxiety. Because again, everyone is going to get started with SSRIs. And we're only going to these if we need additional or alternative options. Um, so these medications, we'll start with the mechanism of action. It's exactly like it sounds. It blocks the body from getting rid of both serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, however, it does have more of an effect, at least specifically Venlafax, Venlafax and duloxetine, which are two of the most used SNRIs. There are some others that do work more on the norepinephrine part, but these are the more commonly used, and these do more to elevate the level of serotonin more than the norepinephrine. The uses for this is going to be obviously for depression and anxiety, but also we can use these drugs for migraine prevention, for neuropathic pain, such as fibromyalgia. We can also use it for chronic MS pain, as well as stress incontinence. So we have a bunch of different uses. Most of these are off-label, in addition to the depression and anxiety. This medication, in addition to the usual side effects that I listed on the previous slide, can also cause anorexia in patients. So if patients underweight, um, certainly if they're bulimic or anything like that, or anorexic, we want to stay away from this drug. This medication, like I already said, is used for a second line or even further down the line option. Next, we have bupropion. This is becoming more and more popular in mental health. Bupropion is commonly used as a, as a go-to medication for patients who are not tolerating SSRIs for whatever reason, or it can be used in addition to an SSRI under close supervision, again, because at risk of serotonin syndrome. How does this one work? It inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, so it works differently than an SSRI. Um, and this medication is indicated for depression. It's also used off-label for smoking cessation. If you're using it for smoking cessation, that's the brand name over there is Zyban, versus for depression, it's going to be Wellbutrin. Now, this medication is, like I said, more commonly used. It does help patients have improved focus. So that's a benefit. And that's why you see it uh, used sometimes off-label for ADHD. Um, you will also see this used sometimes off-label for ADHD simply because a primary care provider is not going to be diagnosing a patient with ADHD. That would definitely stick to the um, psych mental health or the psychiatric physician. However, in the primary care setting, if they wanted to sort of play around with treating ADHD a little bit, not recommending this, just saying reality, if they want to play around with treating it, they could treat this under as treating for their depression. It would help if they had ADHD as well. This medication does have a major um, adverse effect that it can increase the risk of seizures. I've seen this on a bunch of NP level tests. So if you're an NP student, make sure you uh, are aware of that. The other side effects would be the headache, insomnia, GI upset, and poor revision. But again, this is generally considered a pretty safe medication. This is very commonly used. Um, for depression and anxiety. Now we're going to go on to a bunch of much less used medication. SSRIs are number one, bupropion and SNRIs are generally the second choice um, drug, but now we're going to go on to the third and beyond choice drug. So we have the MAOIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. If you remember from anatomy and physiology, monoamine oxidase is the enzyme that gets rid of norepinephrine. 
So this is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So again, it inhibits the body from getting rid of norepinephrine, thereby increasing your level of norepinephrine. The drugs over here are phenylzine or selgaline. These medications, I just said how they work. These are used to treat depression. This is actually the oldest drug class that was officially used to treat depression. It's the oldest antidepressant that we have. Um, the adverse effects are that it can cause a hypertensive crisis. It can also cause respiratory and circulatory emergencies. Now, this medication has interacts with more medications than probably anything else other than maybe warfarin. So this is definitely something that you have to go through each and every drug that a patient's on before you prescribe this and make sure there's no interactions. Also, this interacts with any food that has tyramine. And in those cases, it can mess with the patient's blood pressure. So we definitely want to make sure that the patient is thoroughly educated on what foods contain tyramine and how to avoid those. Again, between that and the drug interactions, this is really basically a last line drug today for depression, even though it's the oldest one. Tricyclic antidepressants, that's another drug class. This one has a very similar mechanism of action to SNRIs. It also blocks the body from getting rid of serotonin and norepinephrine, but it does it differently than the SNRIs. Uh, these are tricyclic antidepressants. Now, the drugs over here are amitriptyline, doxepine, and imipramine. These drugs, uh, again, are used for depression, they're used for anxiety. They're also used for a few more things. Um, in addition to that, they can cause orthostatic hypertension. They can cause anticholinergic effects, dry mouth, dry eyes, constipation, all of that. It can cause sedation in some patients, and it can also cause fatal dysrhythmias. This is also one of the older classes of um, antidepressants. We don't use this again um, as much as we used to in the past because the SSRIs have definitely moved to the first of the for the first line drug class. However, we do still use these. Use these. these are very difficult if a patient um, overdoses on these because they're attempting suicide. These are often very difficult to reverse because of that issue that it can cause fatal dysrhythmias. Next, we have, again, some of the less used option. I'm going to skip the first point and go to the second one first, antipsychotics. So we have tons of antipsychotics, such as aripiprazole, brexipiprazole. That's a whole drug class that you uh, are learning about in mental health. However, these drugs are also some labeled, some off-labeled for the use of regular good old depression as well. So this is something that you have another option to use. Again, this class of drugs really wouldn't be prescribed much in a primary care, but if you're a psych mental health, then absolutely this would be um, an option to use for depression. And from what I'm told, a lot of the psych providers are preferring this over most of the other backup options to use for depression. However, it is a more aggressive option. It's a more powerful option. And we're going to learn more about all of these antipsychotics in detail in this next uh, mental health lecture that we're going to make on bipolar ADHD and schizophrenia. Next, I want to talk about trazodone. Trazodone is often labeled as a serotonin modulator or as an atypical antidepressant. This medication works, obviously, like it sounds. It modulates your serotonin level. It also has a major aspect of inhibiting histamine, just like antihistamines like Benadryl cause um, uh, sedation and drowsiness. This medication is often used off-label for insomnia. In fact, this is our go-to example when we teach students about off-label in general in basic nursing school. Trazodone is used more off-label than it's labeled use. It's labeled use for depression is less of the percentage of the drug prescribed versus we use it much more for insomnia. In fact, in a lot of the hospital guidelines for inpatients that have insomnia that are not able to sleep in the hospital, which is all the time, we have all our PRN standing orders. Trazodone is very often right up there on the list of drugs that we have specifically for insomnia. So that wraps up the different drugs that we have. Now let's go through some of the drug factors that we have to know. First of all, before we go any further, all of the antidepressants have a black box warning of risk of suicide. So you definitely need to make sure that you're assessing every one of your patients for risk of suicide. And for testing purposes, they all have that black box warning. Next, almost all of these drugs, you have to be careful with serotonin syndrome. Again, there was just a few of them that didn't really deal with serotonin. They dealt only with dopamine and norepinephrine, such as bupropion. But even that one can have some minimal effect on serotonin if a patient's taking multiple serotonin medications. So let's talk about it. Serotonin syndrome is where a patient is taking their serotonin level gets too high in their body. Again, we said at the very beginning that we want a patient's serotonin level to come up to treat depression, but not too high and not too fast. So what causes serotonin syndrome? Exactly that, too high or too fast. If we don't titrate a drug up, if we go straight to um, 100 milligrams of sertraline uh, on a patient that's five foot nothing and 100 pounds, that can cause it. If we're... Um, if the patient's taking a, a CAM, such as St. John's wort, you should know that one. St. John's wort can increase serotonin. So if patient's taking our prescription serotonin medication plus St. John's wort, that can cause it. 
or if the patient's taking multiple serotonin medications, either on purpose or by accident, different providers not talking to each other, all of those are the risk factors for serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is treated, is uh, presented by a triad of effects. The three effects are mental status changes, that's that AMS, autonomic nervous system overactivity. And I listed this one out because most of the tests I've seen for NP level about serotonin syndrome do talk about the tachycardia, the hyperthermia, the hypertension, the nausea, the vomiting, and the diaphoresis. And the third part of that triage is neuromuscular hyperactivity, um, exactly like it sounds. So those are the three things that we look for in serotonin, serotonin syndrome. If you're looking at a test for advanced pharmacology or on your board certifications. If you see those three, they're talking about serotonin syndrome. There is something called the Hunter serotonin toxicity criteria. This is part of how we diagnose serotonin syndrome. And the treatment here, there's no actual specific treatment. It also depends on which medication they overdosed on. Certainly, first and foremost, figure out what happened. Did they get too high of a dose? Did they get too, um, or were they taking too much? Did they overdose on purpose? What's going on? But certainly discontinue the issue that's causing that serotonin medication, that's causing that serotonin syndrome. Most commonly, it's going to be that the patient was on multiple serotonin medications and also provide supportive care. So if they're having um, uh, hypertension, we might treat it with a beta blocker, things like that. Next, when we transition a patient between medications, which happens all the time, because SSRIs are first-line drug, it will work for most patients, but there's certainly a large percentage of patients that it won't work for, and we're going to want to move on to something else. When we're moving on to another serotonin medication, or really any antidepressant, unless we're specifically trying to do dual therapy, such as with Wellbutrin, we do want to make sure that we're doing a proper transition between medications. And it gets a, a drop more complicated here than in most other areas. Um, so the way we do it over here is as follows, is really three or four different pathways to do this. Number one, which is the most conservative approach, is you taper down the patient's medication, you give them a washout period, which usually from what I've seen in the, most of the APRF textbooks, it says two to five times the half-life. So most of these drugs work for about 12 to 24 hours. So two to five times, that would be roughly uh, two to five days that we would give them to get the body completely washed out. And then we would slowly titrate up on the next medication. That's the most conservative strategy. The big downside to that, and that's the safest strategy, but the big downside to that is the patient's gonna be completely without any antidepressant for a period of time, especially considering these medications, almost all of these take two to four weeks until they really start to help a patient improve their depression, improve their anxiety symptoms. So that's the downside to that. We could do it a little bit more aggressive, which would be tapering down and giving them one to two uh, or giving them uh, the next day right on to the next medication. So we came completely off one. And then the next day we start the next one. Um, in that case, we didn't do a washout period, but we did completely stop one before moving on to the next one. That would be a little bit more aggressive um, and can often be done in most settings. However, we get can get more aggressive or more complicated, I should say, where we slowly start coming off one and we already start slowly titrating up on the other one. Generally, that method um, should be done under the supervision of someone that specializes in this, like psych mental health or psych MPs, but definitely give some thought and in your documentation as a nurse practitioner, definitely make sure you're documenting that MDM, that medical decision-making of how you're transitioning the patient to medications and why you chose that strategy. Next, every single patient visit for depression or anxiety, you must document um, assessment for suicidal ideation. Um, we already talked about the black box warning that almost all of these drugs have that risk of suicide and always document that you refer the patient for psychotherapy, whether it's a psych specialist or just to a, um, a non-medical specialist, such as a therapist, a marriage counselor, et cetera. And that's all I have for today. Here's the references for this lecture. If you have any questions, please reach out. Please subscribe to our channel to keep these videos coming. Have a great day.